to you a little bit about a lot of things that are a lot about a little bit, which is the other way I could have done it. But when Jock talked to me, he said it probably would be better to give a bit of introduction to the Great Artesian Basin before I get into talking about how it's managed and what's happening today and what might happen in the future, which is where I really want to go. But I thought I'd give a bit of information about the basin, a little bit about springs. I'll let Colin do that because he knows a lot more about it than I do, but I'll carry on. I want to talk a little bit about managing Australia's water resources because I think if I'm going to talk about what's happening to the basin, I really need to talk a little bit about water law and what's happened in Australia relative to water law in the past few years. And I'll go over that really fast. Um, then a little bit about the Great Artesian Basin and the history of one of his first started Jews, a bit about the management and sort of where we are today. So I'll try and get through all that in about 40 minutes. The great, most of you know, I'm assuming most of you know a fair amount about the Great Artesian Basin. It's, um, it's underlies about 23% of Australia, but probably the most important thing about it, it underlies most of the arid and semi-arid areas of the country. And it's really the only reliable water source over all that area. It was formed between 65 and 190 million years ago by a series of shallow seas, erosion periods, shallow seas, erosion periods, which ended up uh, forming a series of sandstone aquifers. It isn't, the, it isn't actually aquifers filled with water, it's aquifers filled with sandstone. And these are underlaying and overlaying with siltstone or mudstone, which are mostly impervious to water. They're called aquitards, and they're what keep the water in there. The deepest part of the basin is about 3,000 meters, which means it's about the deepest artesian basin, usable artesian basin in the world. It's recharged by rainfall, but only less than 2% of the rainfall that falls on Australia really, or falls on the recharge area really goes into the basin. So it's recharged a long-term process. The recharge areas in the basin are around, around this side of the basin, and somewhat on, on the western side, recent research has shown that recently in the past few hundred or few thousand years, the western side of the basin recharge has been almost insignificant. So really the recharge comes from the Great Dividing Range in Queensland and New South Wales. And the water flows from east to west across the basin and out of springs that I'll talk to you about. This is sort of a schematic diagram to give you an idea of how artesian basins work. The rainfall is taken in where the beds are exposed. In the case of the GAB, that's on the dividing range. And about, as I said, about 2% of the water filters into the basin, slowly filters through, and then slowly moves towards the other side. And the water is artesian because where it flows in is much higher than, than the center part of the basin. And so when you put a hole in the basin, the water comes out. And that's what it means by being artesian. If you get in a higher area in the basin, such as in the range, of course, then it's sub-artesian, and the water doesn't come to the surface. The artesian part of it's very important for the springs, because they totally depend on the artesian flow. If you really look at the cross-section of the basin, this is just the very northern part of South Australia. It's much more complex than that diagram, obviously. But it, and it changes, the aquifers change in different parts of the basin. In Queensland and New South Wales, there are several aquifers that have water in them, and they're used for different things, and the water quality is different. I won't spend time on that now. In South Australia, we mostly have one, and the water quality in it varies across the basin, and um, also um, within areas around the state. When the water reaches the surface from the basin, it's usually from 30 to 50 degrees C. There are places in the basin, especially top of the Birdsville Tract in the very western part of uh, Queensland and some of the areas in the Channel Country where the water might be close to 100 degrees C when it comes to the surface. And in those kinds of places, it has about 130 meters of head above the ground. So when wells are put in, you can get flows that will go 100 meters in the air. In, in those areas, it'd be 100 degrees C. And as you can imagine, that's fairly hard to deal with when the water comes out like that. 
the horizontal flow rate in the basin is about a one to five meters. This is really, there's been some research recently, and just in the past few years, there's been a big research study on the basin. And the court's out a little bit on, on whether that flow takes place clear across the basin. Most of the hydrogeologists now are saying that there are places in the basin where the water doesn't flow at all, where it is just in pools. And until the pressure changes, it will stay in those pools. And so it isn't really a direct flow from one side of the basin to the other. Because the basin isn't homogeneous, because the geology of the basin isn't homogeneous, it'll flow more quickly or more slowly. And also, it depends a lot on the sandstone. If it's very fine sandstone, it doesn't flow very quickly. If it's more coarse sandstone, it does. Just for example, the area around Inaminka, they put wells up there, and the sandstone is so fine you can't even run a garden hose out of the well. It just won't come out. On the other hand, the areas around Udnadatta has very coarse sandstone, and even though there's not very high pressure, you get very high flows. So it varies a lot across the basin, and the, the water moves at different rates, and the pressure changes at different rates, so what, which is one of the things that makes it very hard to model when you start trying to use the basin. <clears throat> It's really hard to get your head around how big the basin is. It's really Australia's largest source of fresh water by a long way. It's about 65,000 cubic kilometers. <laughs> and that's a lot of water. A, a little easier one, it's about 1,100 Sydney harbors. So that's about how much water is in the basin, about 1,100 Sydney harbors. So that's, it's, it's a very large water resource. Now, the question is how much of that can we use, and we'll get into that a bit later. But it is, a, it's, you know, it's much larger than the Snowy Murray and Orange schemes all put together, by far. And it's the only reliable water source in, in most of Arid Australia. So it's totally critical to a whole bunch of things that we do, a whole bunch of natural things that happen in that area. <coughs> I want to talk a little bit about springs. You've probably been up and seen them and you know about them, I'm sure Colin's talked to you about them, so I won't go in, into it much. But I just want to talk a little bit about springs just to emphasize how important they are to the management of the basin. <clears throat> springs really occur because the geology of the basin, as I said, isn't consistent across the basin. It has, it has lots of faults, it has lots of areas that go up and down, and areas where the aquitard, the, the sandstone or siltstone above the, <clears throat> the water areas, above the aquifers, is more or less thick. So you get differences in flow. And whenever there's a, an anomaly, like a fault in the basin, then the water will travel upward to the surface and form springs. And this happens at various places across the basin, but mostly around the margins. And as I said, the springs occur where there's some sort of an anomaly. They come to the surface, and if they build up deposits, that I won't go into the whole thing about how they build up at the moment, but if they build up deposits, they're called mound springs, but there are lots and lots of other kinds of springs around the basin that aren't really mound springs. They come up in you know, all kinds of areas. In Queensland, they come up in huge wetland areas called boggle mosses, for example. So there's lots of different kinds of springs, uh, only a few of which are mound springs. There are 12 major spring groups around the Great Artesian Basin and over 7,000 vents. There were 7,000 individual springs and major spring groups. There are about, Travis tells me now, 4,500 is too small. <laughs> there's more than that. There's about 5,000 and something individual springs in South Australia. And that's interesting and it's important because all of these are important springs, but it's interesting because they, they start and cease to flow naturally. Some of them flow, that have been flowing for years will stop and another band will open up someplace else and some will flow quick, more quickly for some years and they'll flow less for other years. And it makes it very, very difficult to monitor spring flow. And it makes it very difficult, especially for resource companies like BHP diligent, for example, to, to decide what their impact might be on those springs. Um, so there's a lot of different kinds of springs and a lot of different kinds of flow rates. About 40% of the springs in the basin ceased to flow since we started taking water out through bores. 
So almost half of them have ceased to flow. Some in South Australia, but mainly in New South Wales and Queensland. But I guess the most important thing I can say about springs is that springs are really islands of wet and a sea of dry, if you can think of them that way. For tens of thousands of years, there's been these little islands of permanent water and a total sea of dry around them. So the things that live there are, are generally endemic. They, there's Travis Gotch, who you probably know and know of, said, show me a spring and I'll show you an endemic species. And that's probably true. You can find them in almost any spring. So they're very important. They're also very important for lots of things that have happened in the, in the basin. These kinds of springs, these particular kinds of, of artesian springs like the GAB are very rare. They're very rare because of the way they're formed, but they're also very rare because of the quality of water and the different, con different qualities of water that comes out of the springs. And the qualities of water determine the kinds of things that live there. And even though they've been studied for quite some time, we're just starting to get a handle on the relationship between the water and the process that drives that water and the things that live there and how that might best be managed. So they're very rare, and as it says, there's endemic species in every spring group has some endemic species there that are very important. They're very culturally significant. Most of the dreaming lines, the, the Aboriginal dreaming line, the Aboriginal trade routes from the center of Australia down to the Flinders and down into the southern part of Australia go along the Union Data track and down the, the stream of springs for very good reasons. It's the only water there is. And so because it's the only water, the Aboriginals have used it for thousands of years. And then, of course, the Europeans, when they first came here and settled, did the same thing. There, were, there was no way to get to the center of Australia back to the center of Australia without using the string of springs. And so everything that's happened in Australia, every human thing that's happened in Australia historically has happened up and down that string of springs. So from a historical point of view, they're extremely significant, extremely important. So from a natural history point of view and from a historical point of view, they're very important bodies of water that we need to make sure we take care of. Okay? They're economically important. They've been used for pastoralism. They've been used for tourism. It's very hard to use them without damaging them. They're important for mining operations, mainly as a pain in the backside. One of the, th one of the conditions of the license for BHP Villain, for example, is maintaining the condition of springs. And as some of you may or may not know, they had problems a few years ago when they put in a new bore field. And because they didn't do the modeling as well as they might have, one of the, some of the springs started to go dry, and they immediately had to drill another one. So there's, there's really importance economically and socially and historically for this, these springs. <coughs> the threats to the springs is mainly drawdown. If, they, if when you take, one water is taken out of a bore, it causes the pressure to reduce in sort of a concentric circle around the bore until it reaches some sort of equilibrium. If you put another bore, it draws more and it draws more, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But this loss of pressure is probably the biggest threat to springs. Oftentimes, the springs depend on a few centimeters or a half a meter of pressure head above the surface. If you reduce the pressure by a half a meter or a meter, the spring will withdraw. So drawdown is, is the biggest threat to springs all over the basin. There are over 5,000 artesian bores in the basin that are currently being used. So there's lots of potential to affect this pressure. We'll talk more about that in a minute. And since, 19, and since 1878, when we first started putting bores in the basin, about 40% of the springs have gone dry. So we've got a real job to take care of the ones that we still have. There's several other processes. Um, in some of the pastoral areas, especially in Queensland, they put big tractors into the springs and dug them out and used them for water and cattle. Now, they're not allowed to do that anymore, but historically it's been done and it isn't a very pretty sight. <laughs> the springs get all pumped up because the cattle are getting them in and they no longer have any of the 
natural or historical values that we talked about before. Overgrazing caused problems with the springs. It's a real, one of the things that's going on now is to try and study what happens when you don't graze springs at all or what happens when you graze them a little bit or what happens, what's the best way to manage the vegetation around springs. If diversity is the thing you're after, then oftentimes not grazing them at all is the best outcome. But unfortunately, we have time to talk about that, right? <laughs> and of course, feral animals and donkeys and pigs and weeds and things are, are a problem with springs all over the basin. Okay, I want to talk to you just for five minutes about, about evolution of water law in Australia. It might be a bit boring, so you can sleep through this bit, and then we'll get back on a greater teaching mm -hmm. basement. I guess the most important thing to think about with water is water is essential for every human activity. It doesn't matter what it is. Or, and probably the most important survival water, water to drink, water for stock, generate wealth. You know, water is an essential part of everything that we do. And no matter what natural resources we use, we still have to have water to go along with it. So, and the other thing that I think is important to keep in mind, and this, I'm doing this very quickly, but the other thing I think is important to keep in mind is that any time we use water, water doesn't sit out in the environment and just wait for somebody to come and use it. If all, every bit of water, especially in a dry environment, but almost any environment is being used. It's being used by the natural animals and plants that are there. It's being used by it to maintain physical processes, it's main, it helps maintain the rain cycle, and a whole bunch of other things. So there isn't such a thing as water that's not being used. And any time humans use water, we have to intervene in the water cycle and change it. And when we do that, there are losers and there are winners, and there are costs. And really what we, what we do, what we've had to do over the last hundred years or so is come up with a rationale for deciding what we can use, where we can use, and what it's going to cost us. Who's going to lose? So that's really what water law is all about. And I think before you can kind of have a basis for allocating water to people to do things, you got to say who owns it? You know, who's really, is it the person who owns the land? Who owns the water? The lakes, the rivers, the groundwater? Who has a right to say who gets survival water and who doesn't? Does everybody get it as much as they want or just a little bit? How much? What about water for creating wealth when businesses need it? How do we allocate that out? And if it's we have to write that off against the environmental things. How do we do that? How do we make those decisions? And what about water for the environment? For a long time, any water that was needed to create wealth was used, and water for environment had no, had no rights. And then what's the role of science and technology in helping us understand this and do a better job? What's the role of governments as compared to private enterprise? And then how do we price all this stuff? And I. And when we talk about pricing water, we're really talking about, as I said before, anytime you intervene in the water cycle, when you take water from where it is to somewhere else where you want it, you create costs. Water weighs a, a ton of cubic meter just to start with, so if you're moving it, you're using a lot of energy. You gotta have something to move it in. If you change the quality of water, it costs either put stuff in it and make it bad quality, and get it back good again, it costs. If Storm water, of course, costs as soon as you change the flow patterns on, then you start getting storms and that water costs, you have to deal with it, recycle and desalinize water costs and so forth, and effluent costs. And so anything we do with water generates costs. And this has to be figured into how we go about allocating water. <clears throat> and you know, how do we decide the value of production? What, what is it really worth? We talk about inputs like steel and carbon fuels and all that sort of thing. What about water? Does water have a saleable input to production of wealth? Often water is a byproduct of production. Petroleum industry spends hundreds of, no, yeah, hundreds of millions of dollars getting rid of water that they don't need that comes up with the petroleum whether they like it or not. Oftentimes, water is used in production. It comes out as effluent with something in it, and it costs the company to get that back out again before they release it to the environment. For a long time, they didn't pay for it. They just dumped it. And even now, not all companies pay for all the things, all the quality of water they change. So that's that's a cost. And what about the right to access water? Should we just say, well, you can have something, you can have it, or should we charge people? Should we say, well, if you're going to use that much, this is how much it's going to cost you? What you really pay for in Adelaide isn't the water out of your tap, isn't the cost of the water. What you're paying for is the cost of the infrastructure. 
what it costs you to filter the water and what it costs you to run the pipes around and keep them from breaking down like too often. <laughs> so we don't really pay for water, we mostly do it free. Okay, and planning and management and other things cost money too. All right, just a little bit about the evolution of the laws to regulate this stuff. Of course, we start off with common law, which basically says you can do whatever you want as long as you don't interfere with anybody else. And then we said, well, if you have property, then the water on that property or the river next to your property, you've got rights for that. And of course, that worked fine until we started getting cities, until we started getting a lot of people. And then there was legislation required and statutory laws and independent judiciary to make sure that the politicians weren't making the decisions that they followed the laws. And I won't spend heaps of time on that. And of course, in Australia, the state jurisdictions have responsibility for natural resources, not the common law. And so it's really up to the state jurisdictions to make sure that these laws are followed. And what happened in the 1930s through the 1960s is the various laws passed about water, and they set up public agencies with discretionary powers. So each of the states set up a public agency and said, all right, you can manage the water. Um, as a result of that, I guess I could summarize all this stuff in the same area Darling Basin and we could figure it out. Um, it didn't work. Resources were over allocated. Um, the environment lost flows. There was no environmental flows. There was no movement from really wasteful practices that generated nothing to higher value uses and, and so forth. There was inadequate science. We didn't understand the resources. We didn't have an accounting system. When they first were working on the plan for the Murray Darling Basin, for example, they couldn't account for almost, for over one third of the water. They had no idea where it was going. They knew it was there, but they had no idea where it was going. They had no accounting system to work for it. I might say that we're still in that position in the GAB, but we'll get to that later too. There was inadequate management of stock and domestic. Stock and domestic survival water. And there's this thing that's grown up with Australia, just like the password industry that says, if you're using water for stock and domestic, you've got a God-given right for that. And there's never been a way to manage it in a, in a, in a suitable kind of way. Okay, so over allocation, over use, and we'll leave it. Okay, so in 1994, 1992 actually, but it was finished in 1994, the states got together and said, this isn't working. We really gotta do something different. Our water resources are being over allocated, the Murray is, is it's not working and so they the states worked on what was called the national water agreement and the national water agreement did some important things and i won't go over all of them just a couple it really said that it separated water from land that because you're on your land your water is separate it said the water belongs to the crown the water belongs to the government and the government has complete right to say who uses it, who doesn't under what circumstances you it also, for the first time in history, said that the environment had a legitimate right to water in court, just like a person. That for the first time in the history of Australia, the environment had a legal right to have water. And that was part of this agreement in 1994. And it talks a lot about filling knowledge gaps and clear rights and responsibilities for all users and a whole bunch of other things that are really good. And this was discussed and finally signed off by all the ministers of all the states in 1994. It was really, uh, part of the thing was trying to make Australians kept the water literate. I help them understand what some of the things I've been talking about in a lot more detail I've gone on really fast. But that's really what the National Water Agreement was all about. It went for about 10 years and not a lot happened other than the states squabbled amongst themselves and said we can't do this, we can't do that. Finally, within about eight or nine years down the road, the Commonwealth and the states got together and said, it's really not taken off like it's supposed to. The Commonwealth of that state said, well, you better have it take off like it's supposed to or we won't give you any money. <laughs> it's basically what they said. And so they sat down and came up with what's called a National Water Initiative in 2004, which really says, let's get going on this thing. Let's build on it, make sure it all happens. All right? And they want nationally consistent outcomes over all the states, not all the states doing their own thing and not doing stuff. Let's have national consistent outcomes. And that was signed off in 2004. <clears throat> okay, I won't say a lot about this. Um, water markets and trading were the big thing, and I wish I had some time to explain why that's important, but I won't. Um, and it's really, 
integrating the management of environmental water along with other water and making sure that anything that was started up was viable and sustainable. And that was the big thing in this. And, and all the states said, yeah, we'll do that. Okay, let's back, back to JB. Sorry about that little side trip there, but I, I thought it was kind of important to go over that. All right, let's talk about the Great Artesian Basin again. <clears throat> Fauna was first discovered in 1878, and they decided there was artesian water there. The first bore that was drilled in 1885. And by 1910, there were 1,500 bores drilled, so you can see it was fairly popular. And you can imagine at that time how long it took to drill bores. Some of these are over 1,000 meters deep, and they were building them, drilling them with steam drills, the kind of a big steam driver on the top that turns a half a turn. Some of the bores on the Birdsville track, for example, it took them three, three years to drill one bore. So, you know, you're talking by 1910, 1,500 bores. That's, that's a big movement in short time. The South Australian government, of course, drilled bores down the, down the stock routes, down the Birdsville track and the Strzelecki track, and some others as well as that, um, which they paid for around this time in the early, early part of the 20th century. There have been about 5,800 artesian bores drilled in the basin now, and thousands of sub-artesian bores as well as that, in other words, bores around the edges of the surface, but about about 5,800 bores have been drilled in the basin. <clears throat> the first legislation where they started getting worried about the fact that on all of these bores that were drilled, I might add, all of these 5,800 bores were initially drilled, or not all of them, 5,800 part of those were drilled later, but all the initial bores were just drilled in the ground, the waters let flow out of the ground, and it looked basically like those pictures. <laughs> and it flowed out of the ground. And by 1910, they were starting to become concerned. They said, you know, we can't just keep poking holes in this thing and let the water run out. We're going to have problems soon. The pressure was going down. They were afraid they were going to run out of water because they had no novel idea how much water there was. And they started having interstate meetings in about 1915. They ran off and on until 1934. They finally decided they were going to have an agreement to say, yeah, we really got to do something. So it took them from 1913 to 1934 to really decide they were going to do something about it. By 1945, they had it signed off. The war got in the way a little bit, so it slowed a little. And by 1954, the state started saying, all right, you have to have a license, and you have to put headworks on the bore, and you have to really start doing something. So 1954. South Australia, because the bores in South Australia were drilled by the government, we started our bore rehabilitation in 1977. We were the first states to start. The others started in the early 80s, and the bore rehabilitation started. So things really started to take shape after about 100 years to try and do something about the basin. By then, by the early 1990s, when I first started getting involved in this, um, <clears throat> well, I started in the 80s in, in South Australia, but the 1990s, it became a basin-wide movement to say, this is, we really have to do something. About 1,500 bores, it's artesian bores, it ceased the flow across the basin. About 3,000 flowing bores, oh, no more than 1,000 springs that ceased to flow, and about 3,000 flowing bores, there were about 3,000 flowing bores that were untapped, that's what I'm trying to say. There were about 3,000 flowing bores just flowing water on the ground. Coming up through the flowing, no head works on them at all, and no way to shut them in. And the total discharge was about 1,600 megaliters, or 1,600 limbic swimming pools, if you want to look at that one. 1,600 megaliters a day was flowing onto the ground around the basin. Most of these bores were pastoral bores that were used to water cattle, and they went into bore drains. I'll show you some photos of them in a minute, and flowed down the bore drain, and probably well over 90% of the water just evaporated or something in the soil. And so we were in a situation in the early 90s, through the 90s, where this was, this was what was happening. This shows you where the bores are in the basin. Sorry the dots are so small, but maybe you can get an idea. That each one of those dots is a bore. The color code, won't, I, we won't worry about it because it's too small, but it gives you an idea of how many bores there are in the Great Artesian Basin now. Lots. This shows you about pressure decline. The darker the color, the more the pressure has declined. The really dark part in the center on the border between New South Wales and Queensland is the pressure has declined by more than 100 meters. Artesian pressures fall by more than 100 meters because there's so many bores drilled, 
pressure decline around each bore goes down and then more, go, more goes down. So more than 100 meters. And as I, as I said before, that means a lot of the bores around that area cease to flow. And all the springs around there, of course, cease to flow by that time. So this, is, this was the situation we found ourselves in in the late 1990s. <clears throat> now, the groundwater resource, and this is as of 2000. I'm sorry I don't have newer ones, but I'll tell you about why I don't have it a minute. At that time, the GAB was supporting about $4.5 billion in wealth generation. It was, it was known at that time that the pastoral bores could be reduced by at least 80%. In other words, the amount of water being used by the pastoral industry could be reduced by 80% without affecting the industry at all. So that was known. It was, in, that the, it was important this groundwater resource sustain the springs and health and communities and industries and all the things we relied on. There is no alternative source of water in that whole area of Australia other than the GAB. And that's the way we were treating it. Right? <clears throat> We've gone over most of these, but I, I guess it's safe to say that anything that was happening in the basin, anything that still happens in the basin, really depends on the GAB. There won't be anything going on there of any major significance even now that and that's been more emphasized recently all right let's talk about so what are the big issues that are that were that were facing the basin in the 90s and that are facing the basin now <clears throat> okay the biggest threat to the basin is just pressure reduction so even though we talk a lot about reducing waste which is a good thing we don't want 1,500 gigaliters a day of water running on the ground for nothing. But the big issue is really pressure reduction. If the basin is going to continue to function the way it needs to, and if we're going to, re if we're going to be able to manage these springs that we're talking about before, maintain all those animals and the, and the cultural sites and all the other things that go with the springs, if we're going to be able to do that, then we've got to manage the pressure reduction. We've got to be able to figure out how much pressure we can reduce where and how to, make, how to sustain that pressure and not have it continue to fall. Also, because after the bores, when, when they put bores in, especially the original ones were put in with steel casing, and then they go down through some very salty, shallow aquifers, they rust out, and so there's a lot of cross-contamination between these shallow aquifers and the deeper ones, and that's a problem. <clears throat> And the effect is, is on the GAB flows out of the basin. And the other, one of the other ones is the poor man's recharge areas. I won't talk a lot about that, other than the fact that in the recharge areas along the Great Dividing Range, there's a lot of sil siltation of rivers because of bad farming practices and mining practices. And it's really a question now whether as much rain is filtering down into these aquifers as did before this change of land practices started up there. And again, I don't have a lot of time to talk about that right now. The other problem is just wasteful and poorly maintained water distribution systems. Early on, there wasn't the technology around to put in really good systems, and they couldn't really deal with 100 degree water that's coming out at 100 degrees PSI. So until the 1960s and the early 1970s, they really didn't have the technology to deal with. They do now. There is technology around, it's, it's, it can be done, it's not easy to do, but it can be done, and it is being done. <clears throat> the other problem that I probably need to just mention is that when you put in board drains, and board drains sometimes go 20 kilometers or 30 kilometers, weeds grow up around the board drains and it provides water for feral animals, water for weeds, and it makes a total management miss and very hard to manage stock because the water is always there. Okay. So there was real a need for government intervention at that stage. The government really had to stop just nibbling around the edges and rehabilitating a few bores in Queensland and a few in New South Wales and a few in South Australia and really get serious and say, we've got to do something about this. And um, it became obvious that there was a real limited capacity of a lot of landholders to, to, to change the bores that they have 
The price has gone up quite considerably now, but even then we're talking half a million or a million dollars to change the water system on their property. And oftentimes these landholders just didn't have that kind of money. There was some government assistance available, but it was very little and it came out like sort of like the land care stuff of a contract here and a contract there and nothing really coordinated, nothing really going on. And so it wasn't really happening. And We'll always have a place, because there's so many bores in the basin, we'll always have bores that continue to fail and infrastructure to keep fail. We'll never get to a place where we say, boy, we're all done and we can walk away from it now. When you've got thousands of bores, uh, that much pressure or that much heat, they'll continue to fail. And they have. Since that time, they'll continue to fail. But there was no con there's no plan for continued maintenance, and so things were getting worse than that. All right. So in 2000 or so, uh, their entrepreneurial pastoralist in Queensland stirred up his local member and stirred up a lot of other people. A lot of people got together and said, all right, the time is come when we've got to really take care of our great artesian basin, we're going to lose it. And the Commonwealth and the states agreed, and they set up a cross-jurisdictional mechanism to do this, and I won't go into all the ramifications of that, it was kind of a fun time. And it set up a mechanism to report to Commonwealth and state ministers to say this is what needs to be done. <clears throat> they developed a, a management plan which set out this is the kind of things that need to happen, and mainly focused on controlling all these uncontrolled wars that I was talking about before. How you go about, how do we go about getting these things under control and cutting the pastoral use of water by 80 or 85 percent. How do we go about doing that? And we worked on a plan for a couple of years and fortunately there was an election about that time and I won't mention names because I probably will not. But one Labour member said, yeah, we'll back that. And then as a result, the Liberals said the same thing. Well, we'll back that, and there was an election because they both said that they both had to back it, so they did. And was, that was when the Liberal government came in, and they set up a program, or they accepted a program which we had set up called GABSI, or the Great Australian, the Great Artesian Basin Sustainability Initiative. And it was signed off in 2000, and the plan said that they'd give about $350 million of taxpayer money over 15 years to rehabilitate the basin. And they agreed to the first three years of a funding package for about a hundred million dollars. Okay? And it was to be a 30, 30, 40 thing, which meant 30% from the federal government, 30% from the state government, and 40% from the landholder to rehabilitate the water system on these pastoral properties. And that was what we set up. And the money was forthcoming and we we spent a lot of time and a lot of effort in education. We were around the properties, we talked to landholders, we CSLRO got involved, did some research and showed them how the water could be used better. We did a lot of things over the first four or five years of this. And it was quite an exciting time. I was fortunate enough to work with the CSRO on their study and we really did some good things in the past. We got quite enthusiastic about the things they could do by going from these flowing bore systems into a closed delivery system. I'll show you some pictures of that in a minute. So the first round finished in 2004. We did an assessment and a report. And the second round in 2007, the third round in 2014. And fortunately, I can say that the governments funded these rounds. And they continued, the states and the federal government continued to fund these rounds. And the, the attitude of the past was completely changed from saying, no, we can't, we've got to have board drains because our calves won't, we, our, sheep won't, our Jews won't lamb, and we, the calves won't be born, and all kinds of other reasons. They changed and totally started supporting them over that period of time. Some funding continued in 2015, but there were some problems with implementation as far as states went, so not much, very much of it got spent, unfortunately. But following 2015, the government made it very clear, both the states and the federal government made it very clear that from now on, the maintenance of all this stuff is a responsibility of the landholder, and that's a problem as I'll get to in a while. Okay, so there was really marked improvements over this time. A lot of bores were rehabilitated, a lot of water was saved, 20,000 kilometers of bore drain was knocked out, but there's still a long way to 
Okay, this is basically what the bores looked like before they started. It's just a floating bore that flows out of the ground and down a long ditch like that. And in central New South Wales and Queensland, what they did over a period of 30 or 40 years is every time one of these bore drains would come to an end because it sunk into the ground or evaporated, they'd drill another bore and put in another bore drain. So that area from the air up there, when I first went up there in the early 90s, when I flew over, it looked like spaghetti. It looked like just a whole series of channels with water running all over the place out in big long bore drains like that. In South Australia, we didn't really dig bore drains, but most of our bores just ran in creeks. And a lot of you have seen those where it runs in the creeks up in the northern part of South Australia. So we weren't much different. But the difference was Queensland had about 1,800 or 2,000 bores. New South Wales had over 1,000. We had about 350. So our problem was much smaller. And the other thing is the bores in South Australia were drilled by the government and really belonged to the government. The government said they would pay for fixing up the bores. The landowner could pay for fixing up the bore drains. So that was a bit of a difference for this thing. Anyway, this is sort of what it looked like. The drillers would go in and either plug the bore, and if they plug it, they put heavy mud down at first and then cement and cement it in and say this bore is for saving, and then they drill another one. Or they, if the bore was not too out of shape, they relined it, re-cemented it, and then used it again. And then they shut the water down, which is a hard thing to do if these bores were very high pressure and high temperature. When they got shut down, they were more like this, with nice headworks on them, so you could shut the water completely off and the water, run the water through, and they put in miles and miles, kilometers and kilometers of pipes with tanks and troughs and valves so that the cattle could get the water they need, but it didn't run all over the place. And the government, on a 60-40 on a basis, paid for putting in the pipes and paid for the tanks and paid for the troughs along with the landholders. And this went on for about 15 years. And over that period of time, I was fortunate enough to go around and negotiate and talk to landholders about all this stuff. And it was pretty exciting. It was, it, it was a lot of fun to do and very rewarding. And this is what it looks like when it's done right. You don't need a big long board drain. You have a trough with a float in it and the tank up on the hill. When the cattle drink it down, the float goes down and it fills the tank up. And that's really wonderful. And, and of course, if you take the cattle out of there, you can shut the tank off. There's no water for feral animals, there's no weeds, and it really increases productivity. And pastoralists can do things like they can shut the water off and the cattle are smart enough that they'll walk over to the next paddock and go to the next water. They don't even have to yard or muster them or anything, they just do it by themselves. So there's a lot of advantages to this. But there's some downsides too, and that is you have to maintain it. And also you really have to watch the water because if you break a pipe or something, of course, in in the arid parts of Australia, the cattle die in two or three days. So you must know there's water in these tanks all the time. And if I had more time, I'd go into some of the things that CSRO found out about using these kind of water systems. That would be another talk for another day. <laughs> all right. So, so really, what did we accomplish between 2000 and 2015? <coughs> I guess the biggest thing is this shift in attitudes. We went from a period where people just accepted the fact that you had to have board drains and you had to have boards down to flow on the ground to where they really accept that this new water system is going to work. The other thing I probably should say first is when we first started on this in 19, in the, in the late 80s and early 90s, we, I was amazed at how little people and politicians and bureaucrats knew about the GAP. Almost nothing. And how interested they were in it. It was in the outback. Nobody knew about it. Nobody cared about it. And they really didn't want to know. And we spent a lot of time and effort uh, trying to help people understand and producing posters like the one I showed you earlier and all kinds of things to try and help people understand what an important water resource is how important it was that we take care of it and do something about it. And, and I think we accomplished that. There was a whole bunch of new technology developed to control bores, new, new kinds of plastics, new kinds of valves, new kinds of tanks, uh, telemetry that you could sit in your house and look at a tank, look at a trough that's 100 kilometers away on the other side of the property without leaving the computer, all kinds of things like that. 
And that was really taken up by the pastoral industry. So they, they made leaps ahead in this 15 year period. And they really accepted a closed water delivery system, one that's in a tank and a trough. This, this is called a closed water delivery system, one that has tanks and troughs and valves. That's what's all over the place. Okay. <clears throat> and there was a lot of other things that we did too. And the other thing that happened over this period, and I think Colin probably testified to this, and that is there, there became an emphasis on the springs. People finally decided the springs were worth saving, worth doing some work on, some money for the certs, there was some conservation areas set around springs. A lot of things happened in this period which really emphasized the fact that the springs were important. <clears throat> okay, by the end of June of 2014, there have been about a thousand bores that have been capped and controlled. So all those bore drains have been eliminated. 20,000 kilometers of bore drains out of the 32,000 kilometers or so that are up. And there have been about 26,000 kilometers of piping installed. So the plastic companies love us. They'll do anything for us. I ask them, don't take them flying out to, for all of no. them. But there's all kinds of, you can imagine the amount of, of development that took place. In fact, I'll just one little story. One of the things that happened in South Australia is that when you run these pipes out a long way, the pipes could be run for uh, 10 kilometers or 15 kilometers or 20 kilometers by the pressure head in the bore. In other words, just the artesian pressure will push it along the trough. But as you get out further with the friction and so forth in the pipe, you lose the pressure. And pastoralists wanted to extend their pipe out 50 kilometers or 80 kilometers from the bore, and they couldn't do that because they had no water. So some of the pastoralists got together with one of the big pump companies, and I won't give them a commercial, but one of the big pump companies said, this is our problem. They went back to Belgium and invented a pump, which is now used all over the world, that was invented to solve the problem in Northern South Australia. So a lot of new things happened, a lot of good things happened. Okay, the cost up until 2015 was about 200, just over 220 million, and about 150,000 that was landholder stuff. Um, there's still about 700 odd bores to cap and about 12,000 kilometers of board range. So we're not finished. There's no more money for gap C. Where this money's gonna come from for that, I don't know, it's one of our, one of the things we're working on right now, but they said there's not gonna put taxpayers' money directly into this like they have before, so we're working on something. All right, so that brings us, so where are we now? That brings us up to what happened in 2014. So where are we now? The strategic management plan that we produced in, that we produced in 2000, and 2000 was to go for 15 years. So it's now become redundant. We're working on another one. What we have to do is <clears throat> sustain current users and the social infrastructure throughout the basin, which means the small towns and the roads and all the other things that are there. Everybody has to have clear rights and responsibilities, including the pastoral industry. Everybody must know exactly what they get and exactly what they are responsible for if they use that water. And we're working, we still need, still need to work on that. There's a lot of new industries. I could do a whole other session on the coal seam gas industry, for example, or on petroleum or on shale gas or any of those sorts of things. There's all kinds of things happening. One of the biggest things is we must fix and maintain the infrastructure in the basin. All that, we've invested about 500 million now. There's, it's estimated that the infrastructure, the water delivery infrastructure, not counting the mining industry, it's just the pastoral industry, is worth about $2 billion. So we can't just let it fall into disrepair. As I said before, it'll continue to fail. It just does. Where's that? Okay. So we've got to manage the risks of the basin, then identify what they are in management. <clears throat> but we're really saving the greater basin. Basically, the basin to use, not to watch. It's, it's the sustained industry to generate wealth and to encourage people to use it. Okay, the, myth, the challenges that we've got that we're really up against now are there's no good evidence. That thing I showed you a while ago about water use was done in 2000. That's the best one we have. We're now in 2016. We don't have a better one. We know it's out of date. We know it's not right. It's the best one we've got. We've, there's been a lot of research done, a lot of science done in the past 15 years. We don't still completely everybody understand it, especially the managers and the decision makers and the politicians, and therefore we're not using it as well as we should. The science is not being used as well as we should to make decisions. We all say we're going to make evidence-based decisions. 
we don't have a comprehensive accounting system and we don't use the science, how can we make evidence-based decisions? There's not timely adequate policy responses. Things happen in the basin and then it takes forever. We don't really know what's going to follow up gaps. If we have 15 years of funding now, we have none. Or is it all? We're still having boards fail. Where are we going from here? The governance of the basin is still not where it should be. States are responsible for everything. The role of the Commonwealth has changed, especially with the with this current government have said they're going to take a different role, which is fine, no problem with that. But how that shakes out as far as the GAB is concerned is still pretty unclear. 